to do when I when I invite them uh, into this game of life, into this journey of self knowledge, into this great quest. Right. Okay. Um, so again, I, I kind of steer away from you know the spiritual. Hi, my name is Jana. Thank you for watching. This episode starts with an audio introduction and continues with the video content. So remember to watch it until the end and subscribe to this channel, leave a comment, share with friends. Thank you for being here and listening to Timeless Teachings. Have you ever wondered how the minds of people with superpowers function? What makes them different from the rest of the population? How can you develop such capacity within your own mind? Our guest today spent 30 years traveling around the world searching for the most spiritually enlightened masters of the planet and studying methods which allow those people to expand the boundaries of human capabilities. He collaborated with scientists from Stanford, MIT and Cornell, became a UN expert on human potential and the main character in Eleanor Coppola's documentary Superhuman. The man himself, David Verdesi, an anthropologist, a researcher and a life coach. Welcome to the Timeless Teachings Podcast. My name is Jana, and I'm your guide into the world of spirituality, mysticism, and consciousness. We release new episodes every Monday in the form of interviews, teachings, and meditations. Stay tuned, and let's dive deep. Hello, everyone. So he's David with us today, <laughs> and that's going to be an interesting conversation. I can already feel it. So David, thank you for joining us all the way from Moscow this time, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, Moscow, Russia. It's a beautiful sunny day here. Mm -hmm. So David and I, we met, I think it was two years ago now. Was it? I think it was two years ago. And uh, what okay. you could say, mystical circumstances. I was just sharing with David yesterday. We had a chat, and I just told him that, like one month before we met, my astrologer told me that someone like David is going to show up in my life. So that was very interesting. There are indeed no coincidences in life. So that was kind of predestined. And so here we are today going into the non-dual conversations and i would like to ask david first of all um to share a little bit about your life story with us you're kind of an unusual example right you're a western man who very early got interested in the eastern culture and uh, spiritual journey and everything what unfolded after that so before we start talking about the matter it's always nice to hear what is the journey for the person who actually arrived where you are today. So how did it all start? And just briefly, I guess, in a way, what, sure. what did you go through? <laughs> um, well, um, somehow it all starts with these early uh, reminiscences of uh, what, you know, sort of, they are referred as past lives. And this was, you know, very early on, maybe four or five years old. Um, and uh, uh, sort of a clear knowledge of, you know, where I was or what I was doing and, you know, who were my teachers and, you know, my old experience that I had and also that, that I had a lot of sort of unfinished things to do and I was in rush to finish everything. And um, <clears throat> logically, um, when, when as a small child you try to tell this to your parents that you remember these things and you know who you are and what you need to do and where you need to go and where are your teacher you know and they look at you like uh, sure dear whatever you say right and uh, you know but those were very uh, consistent and, and 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 really stable preformed memories you know definitely which you know then in time i i went to to uh, to confirm you know to make sure that they were not just figment of my imaginations right and and, and then the thing continued because i was raised in a in a um, 
let's say, Catholic school, a Jesuit, a priest school, okay? And, and so every day before going to class, uh, we had to go to church to pray. And, uh, you know, uh, four days out of, of five days of school, uh, you know, in the church, I had this this uh, full-on mystical experiences and, and not seizures, but like, you know, really very intense states of ecstasy you know people had to come and shake me up and and the teachers got worried and they thought that you know i, I had sort of epilepsy and you know and instead i was absorbing this music of the spheres and this you know sort of bliss and and, and light and tears would flow from my eyes and everything um which was completely non-conceptual because you know, uh, when you are six years old and, and you are raised by an atheist, because I was raised by my grandmother who was an atheist, uh, it's not that someone indoctrinated you at all. So it was a really very sort of spontaneous uh, experience on that. So th this, these two things really, they set the stage for everything that came after because they, they really were with me consistently and they never, they never left. It's not that they faded, you know, neither the memories, the recollections, the sense of urgency, neither those sort of spontaneous uh, mystical experiences, right? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then sort of the rest of my life was a bit of a constellation of, of, of uh, uh, meetings uh, with, uh, extraordinary people. I mean, I started to meet in my school, and again, I speak when I was six, seven years old, you know, there was the first Chinese family. I mean, Italy is a very monocultural society, especially back then. So those literally was the first experiment of incorporating uh, uh, non-Italian children in, in, the, in the school system, right? Uh, plus, it was sort of a religious institution, you know, and so on. So they, let, they literally sort of stand out, right? And uh, and I was fascinated by these kids and, and you know, we, we, we got very close. And the day that their mother came to pick them up and I, and the first time I saw their mother, I, uh, I ran to her and this one was a recollection of my, then my grandmother sort of confirmed, right? Because all the parents picking up the kids and I ran to this woman and on my knees started to cry, say, please take me home, please take me home. Right. And, um, and so I started to 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 go to the house, uh, and turned out that she was uh, a great uh, qigong master. This woman, sort of one of those hidden masters, and all their families. Their father was the first agoponturist that came to Italy, and he was treating our president. The, the, in Italy, we have sort of a Republican president, right? And so this was a very interesting family, and I grew up with them, and I started to train since very young, you know, in, in the house, you know. And, and from there on, nonstop, one after the other, I started to meet all these teachers, and I knew who my teachers were, and I knew that I had to find them. And, and, and the visions that keep haunting me eventually guided me then to find the teachers that I had to find in this life. So... It's a, it's a very, very long story because it's like it's one after the other a series of encounters until uh, when I was very young, I was about 13, 14, um, you know, the thing became so strong that I decided to leave everything and, and start to follow my visions, uh, which logically was a bit of a surprise um, being so young. And that's it. And uh, my grandmother supported me in this kind of crazy journey. And I left Italy and I went to search for my visions and I met all of them. Um, so, you know, and they kept coming and I, and I kept chasing this vision, very precise locations and faces and people, even dialogues in my head and teaching that I was receiving. And I had to go and find these people, right? And one after the other all of them. So my life was guided by this vision, these voices, and, you know, um, and, and logically this experience that I kept growing. And each of these experiences was like a confirmation of, of the memories that I had of things that I've left unfinished or undone. Um, and, and, you know, which also led to very painful recollection of how I died. Okay. You know, you know, these uh, uh, attempts, let's say like this. And, uh, well, you know, sort of long story short, eventually I completed the old circles and, and all the things that I had to sort of re-experience and, and, and or re, 
meet again. And uh, and here we are. That is, that is about 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are 30 years later um, having this conversation. And I know a little bit about your life. So I'm just going to ask a few questions and let's see how it goes. Okay. So we have no sure. screen today. So let's just see where the energy takes us. Um, First of all, because it is non-dual conversations, that's the name mm. of the program that we have here, I would like to ask mm. for your understanding of non-duality. Mm. So what is it for you? Um, <clears throat> well, um, you know, probably we'll have to contextualize a little bit question in the sense that if we speak of a, of a, a non-dualism uh, on a psychological level, it's uh, um, to not see a separation or a difference uh, between the content of our unconscious and the, the elaboration that we make in sort of in our conscious, you know, that's already a level of, of non-dualism, right? Rather than see them as two separate realms. Um, we can speak of non-dualism in the perspective of uh, uh, understanding that all the different elements and traits of our identity are a unified all. They are, they are not separated, right? Um, we can speak of non-dualism uh, in the perspective of recognizing that um, all is in the concept of psychological reflection, uh, that what is uh, in, in, in psychological terms referred as the shadow, right? Sort of as that that unrecognized, disowned, uh, taboo, hidden, um, um, shameful, you know, part of our being, which is often then translated into that that demonic, that otherness. Okay, it is actually non-dual. It is still just a reflection, sort of, of you, right? Um, all the way to understanding non-duality as uh, um, in a religious terminology um, that is uh, um, in the beginning of, of, of a spiritual journey, you posit that there is a dualism between you and whatever is it that you posit as your goal, rather than a, a, an entity out there that you call a god or a heaven or or doesn't matter, the Tao or Buddha nature, right? And so there is always you and that which you want to reach, and that created dualism, right? And as you progress on the journey, um, this dualism changes gradually until it comes to a state of recognition that there was never a dualism to begin with, because the very um, sort of uh, seeker, the very sense of that, that that person who is looking or is perceiving that dualism is in itself flawed, huh? sort of, okay, as, as, as the old perception and concept. But this one takes, takes years, and it is very important to understand that in the beginning of a path, you need to posit a dualism. So to think or to believe that I am now non-dual and at the beginning of a journey, of uh, um, introspection or of psychological individuation or of a transpersonal um, um, experience, okay, religious or spiritual, that is, uh, to think that you can right away start in a non-dual position is, uh, um, it's counterproductive, okay? So it is also very important to understand that the very dichotomy between dualism and non-dualism is in itself load. Okay, All right. So we need to speak of different uh, sort of steps of a journey of individuation of the psyche of the individual. And at different step of the journey, you do need different instruments. So, and the dualistic instrument is a fundamental, uh, can do without part of this of this sort of progress right um so again you know when we speak of non-dualism you know it, it can be referred to many different sort of uh, levels right um and uh, you know i could elaborate for hours mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. other, many other levels 
you know, where non-dualism applies. So in, if you want to ask something specific, you know, maybe easier you, you zoom in into a specific element of, of, of non-dualism. Yes, yes, let's do that. So to continue then, um, my question would be when you just mentioned stages, right? You mentioned the stages in the development of an individual, the one who decides to go, well, let's say, on the spiritual journey. So could you map it out? Is there some clear stages, like let's say for people who um, who starting their journey or maybe using also your own journey as an example? I mean, you have been on this journey for more than 30 years now, like going really, really deep, right? So here, I think I'm more interested into the real life experiences rather than just book knowledge. So I know that there are stages that are also outlined in books. Mm -hmm. I'm curious more to hear your own perspective through your own life experience. What stages did you go through in your own evolution? Um, Well, uh, you know, uh, I uh, sort of guided myself through it uh, um, with all the the, 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 the limitations of this approach. Um, So nowadays, if I look back, uh, I probably would uh, simplify the journey a lot in a sense that it was very elliptical. You know, I went in, in circle and, and then moved to another circle. And that's something. so it's not, it was not really like a straight journey because uh, I was searching. Okay. So nowadays, um, when I take uh, uh, people um, exactly to what I call the journey of uh, uh, self-knowledge, I call it the game of life, the great quest. And that's really what I do with people. Um, I take them to a much more probably organized experience to a certain extent that is a bit a bit more linear, you know, in the mm-hmm. sense. I mean, the psyche itself, it's not a linear entity or structure, um, but, uh, but the journey, once you know it very clear, once you know the, the path of the labyrinth, uh, okay, it's, it's a very smooth process rather than, okay. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I'm very careful to use the word uh, um, spirituality, dualism, and, you know, you know all, all these um, high-sounding words. Um, I prefer to use more um, psychologically-oriented terms, okay? Mm-hmm. Because what we, what we call spirituality, if I ask anyone what is spirituality, okay? And I do this sometimes. Um, my background is uh, anthropology and philosophy, I studied etymology, semiotics, comparative religion, fairly in depth. Um, so when I ask people, you know, if they can actually own the meaning of the words that they use, I see that people are at loss. So whenever people say, oh, I'm on a spiritual journey, I'm spiritual, and I ask what that exactly means, um, it's blah okay there is nothing under mm-hmm. and, and and if you keep inquiring okay tell me what is it what is it what is it what is it what you actually can't understand it's you know people boil down to start to use finally more actual concrete words and so the what is called the spiritual journey is a journey of individuation okay is the journey that every a human being does from a place of uh, relative ignorance and unconsciousness to a place of uh, uh, a more integrated uh, or wholeness uh, of his of his identity of his personality okay that's called the individuation of of the individual okay so you individuate okay who you are in this process and so you start from uh, generally um, a place of uh, um, I call it the subroutines, identities, and personalities that run amok, okay? Because you have developed a number of these uh, um, identities in order to cope with life, okay? Um, personal expectation, family expectation, and then social expectations, right? Um, and, and those one create a series of neuroses. These neuroses then create coping mechanisms, and these coping mechanisms then are balanced by escaping mechanisms which are then balanced by you know this it's it's all sort of processed organic processing it and there is nothing 
wrong or sick, although these words very often are associated with, oh, that sound like something wrong. No, no, those are just very natural words used to describe a very natural process. So when someone starts, um, they really have no sense of who they are other than their sort of their, their, their immediate social persona. Okay. And the beginning of the journey is to understand that you are not that social persona that, that you thought you were all your life. Okay. All the roles that a social persona has, um, son, daughter, father, mother, wife, husband, uh, rather than, you know, the teacher, businessman or anything like that. And, and in the moment that you start to take out this mask, okay, which spoke for you, you start to come in contact to hear and listen uh, the words that you couldn't hear, that you couldn't dare to say or to speak. So a whole world of, of desires and, and needs, okay, that were remain unvoiced or, or distorted or, or projected in, 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 in external sort of things, okay. Um, and, and a big work that, uh, as a teacher, um, you need to do is to help a person to remove this social identity, the social persona, not because it's bad, but simply to be able to discern that that exists and it is very good. So you should not be, oh, your social persona, your identity, your, 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 you know, mask, or oh, is something wrong, you need to cast it away. No. It is very good, your, your ego identity, okay? It is very good. It is very important to interface with reality, okay? It is very important to function. You just need a to know that it's one thing and it's very good, but you also need to understand who you are behind it and beyond it, okay? Then the second part of the work is uh, um, um, understanding what were those uh, uh, needs, desire, those unspoken words or those unheard, okay, words. And rather you need to start to give them form um, because many of them are then changed and transformed in taboos, something that is, uh, you know, a taboo, sort of you become for yourself a taboo and, and everything that you are become for yourself a taboo, right? And everything that you think, not which is still you, becomes a taboo. Okay, and so there is then the process of recognition of all the parts of you which you have denied, that you say, no, that is not me, or no, that I can't do, or, you know, that I want, but I shouldn't. So all this conflictual dualism, what they call the dualism between mind and body, or mind and heart, you know, I can, but I will not. I want, but I cannot. Okay. Um, and, and who am I in between, right? Am I this part or am I that part? Okay, so the second part is, is to gradually give part to that and start to own, to recognize all these elements uh, uh, gradually as you, okay? And then they start to be integrated into a, an organized frame of reference. The third part of the journey uh, then is to um, access uh, or to, to create a coordination between uh, um, the, the I would call it the archetypal level, okay? So the, the way that your mind frame reality and expresses itself um, and, and therefore identify yourself finally with uh, who you are, not who you were told or molded to be. So you create, you start to recreate yourself uh, in, in, a, in a deliberate way, okay? Once you can do that, then you start to have access to the door between conscious, subconscious, okay, unconscious, superconscious, and collective unconscious. Okay, so this is a big part of my work, which I've uh, um, sort of really spent a lot of time to identify. Okay, and generally uh, in, in in sort of in. in in classical uh, psychology analysis, you know, there is, there is simply a division between conscious and unconscious part, right? And instead what I found is that there are five elements that our sort of psyche, hmm? psyche in Greek uh, actually means soul, okay? In modern term, psyche means generally 
mind. Mm. And uh, um, so I, I, I rather leave it as the original word because it includes both. Okay. So our psyche is actually made of conscious elements, mm, subconscious elements, and unconscious elements. And only when these three parts, uh, they start to communicate or you start to make them whole again and not three comparted, uh, separate identities and realms, then you start to have access to what is called the superconscious. And the superconscious then gives you a view or access to what is the collective unconscious. So once you have the integration of these five, then you can say that you have realized that mandala of your being. And so you start to speak finally of a level of wholeness and integration of non-duality, of non-dualism of your being, okay, which then reflect to a non-dualism of experience and perception of others and reality. Um, so if we want to um, simplify, those will, I would say those are the main steps of the journey that, that I went through, but nowadays I can pronounce them so clearly. Okay, but when I was going through it, uh, it, it definitely there was not this this clarity. Okay, it's a very very long process, and then each teacher brings you to sort of the next step, and, and you don't really realize where you are in the map. So you can only have an understanding of this in retrospection when you look back. So nowadays, when I take people, I have sort of the old picture, and so I know where they are and, 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 you know, where they need to be taken because you have the map and you understand the beginning part and what's the final result that, that you know, um, every human being eventually should get to, okay, in order to be whole, complete, rather than perfect, okay, because perfection, it's, again, it's an idea. Ideas are ideas. They're not real, okay? So our journey is an idea. It's not a, a fantasy of power of becoming perfect, okay? because that's just a fantasy of power, okay? A little bit more and I will be perfect. A little bit more meditation, a little bit more uh, clean, a little bit more pure, a little bit more spiritual, a little bit more this and a little bit less that and I will be perfect, okay? That's called a fantasy of power, okay? And that's not what the process is about, okay? The process is about the unification, that mandala, okay, that cosmos, what is called in Greek cosmos, that means order, okay, the order in the unification of the totality of your being, okay, of the soul of your psyche, okay, of the elements of the conscious, of the subconscious, of the unconscious, of the superconscious, and of the collective unconscious, okay. Um, and, and that's really where we as human beings go to, quite organically, okay, we just need to remove, okay, uh, some, some obstacles or, or blocks, let's say, along, along the way, because, you know, many, many things. And then when you have clarity of what you're doing and a teacher can guide you through it, uh, then it's really pretty glorious and beautiful, okay, as a, as a journey. So that's really what I, what I bring people uh, uh, to do when I, when I invite them uh, into this game of life into this journey of self-knowledge into this great quest right okay. um, so again I, I kind of steer away from you know the spiritual okay mm -hmm. so when you are sharing about those five it's like five elements right mm -hmm. so for you it is clear it is mapped out when you look at somebody you understand where the person is mm -hmm. and this is how you guide yeah. them so now for those who are in the process, which there are many people, as you know, right now in the world and uh, listening or watching right now. Are there some examples you can give them so they can self-identify themselves? Where are they right now out of those five elements that you mentioned? Is there something a bit more specific that the person can say, okay, um, that's where I am. And that's kind of possibly what could be the next step. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, and I don't like easy answers. Uh, um, so <laughs> I will not give any. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, because, because there is not an easy answer. Okay, first of all, one element that I want to say that I want to sort of mention um, is that the whole idea of a practice or of a spiritual practice, or I'm doing this meditation or that meditation, um, it is. Uh, those those are just instruments, okay, that you use uh, in this larger journey or process of individuation. It is not that that thing itself will bring you there, okay. Um, I have spent enough time in, in in retreats, very seriously in mountains and caves and jungles, and I have seen enough of these gurus and masters and yogis and, and hermits of, of all denomination from shamans to Christians to Taoists to, to Hindus to Buddhists and everything um, to tell you that uh, the fact that you are very proficient in some of these sadhanas and some of these practices uh, um, which are very powerful instruments uh, but it doesn't necessarily mm, mean that you are moving along at a speeder, at a faster pace than someone who is not doing it, okay, on a process of, on sorry, on a journey of, of self-knowledge and of wholeness, okay. That is to say that I've seen a number of these yogis which they may have achieved a sense of perfection, so this fantasy of power. Uh, of rising their inner energies and blooming their chakras and having great cities and everything. But they are still very um, unintegrated individuals. Okay. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, I have seen so many of them, okay, that nowadays I, I can tell you that I am certain of it. Okay. I've, I think that I probably journeyed the, um, through maybe 140 different masters, teachers, yogis, uh, shamans. And I, and I don't talk of the commercial type that you find in the internet. I'm talking of people that, you know, live in mountains, caves, and, and jungles, all right? So I would say the real thing, you know, the genuine kind of type. type. And, and many of them, people that display really incredible um, um, abilities, okay, for lack of a better word. Um, and, and so I can definitely say that out of these many that I've met, those who I would nowadays um, um, identify, recognize as integrated whole individuals uh, are extremely few maybe two or three out of, of, of over 100. So this is very important to understand that when people get on a spiritual, so-called again, spiritual journey, they are under the illusion of superiority or being better than others. And they believe, and that's, that's a form of magical thinking, that their magical processes of opening the lotuses of their chakras or moving their energies or I don't know, exchanging energies or whatever it is that they do, give them some kind of magical ability and sense of and superiority that therefore make them better, more developed, more conscious uh, of other people. And 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 that is absolutely non consequential. That is, there is a correlation, but there is no causation, okay? Um, the majority of people that I've encountered in the spiritual communities, um, it's fundamentally um, a bunch of, of uh, narcissists, okay? okay. Um, so it, the very claim that I am conscious, I am woke, you know, I'm so conscious, Okay, I eat only the best food and I take care of myself and I move my energy and me, me, me and my body and my clean, I'm so pure in my mind. Okay, it's a form of, of, of an obsessive compulsive disorder of narcissism. Okay, um, so again, I, I very rarely see actual whole individuals and very often people that go through these spiritual practices, they become more neurotics than 
people that are not doing these processes. So it's a very, very, very delicate, very delicate uh, um, question that you asked. And it is very important to understand that, again, the magical thinking that now I'm going to sit and and visualize energies moving within me, that that's going to fix me and that's going to make me whole, happy, or in the fantasy of power, um, linguistics, uh, perfect uh, or conscious. Okay, it is a great illusion. Okay, it can be a great illusion. And most of the time is a great illusion. So I tend to take away all power and all mystics from these practices because it is not that practice or that specific secret technique or tradition or initiation or whatever is it that is going to make you a whole individual. Okay. That by definition, because it's all, it is truly, truly self-realized, really happy, okay, really at peace, okay, um, and not just positioning himself as, okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, I have a very um, specific view on this matter, let's say like this, <laughs> but, but it doesn't come from, from, from theory, it comes from, from real experience, from having seen Okay, what are considered the exemplars of of the spiritual achievements, uh, and then of course myself because I was under the same illusion. I was driven by a fantasy of power that one more practice, uh, one more chakra, one more initiation, one more year in retreat, uh, one more year of celibacy, uh, one more kind of uh, eating or not eating this or that uh, would make me happier, would make me conscious, would make me more perfect, would make me closer to God. So I was um, driven by the same neurosis, okay? And, and, and that's part of the journey of individuation. So that's what I mentioned in the beginning, that the positing of a dualism in the beginning is diff- it's fundamental. And this, the question is, are you able to go through that phase, don't get stuck in it, uh, and, and keep moving, all right? Rather than believing that, that you moved, but you didn't, and you're still in there, right? Um, so everything has to be taken in perspective. What I'm saying now is not, is not uh, an absolute criticism. It's putting things in perspective, that when you are in this phase of the journey, okay, you are still what they call in the teenage, teenager uh, sort of uh, um, phase of your development, Okay, as as an individual, as a spiritual um, sort of person. Okay, that absolutely, it, it's not even the middle of the process. Okay, it's really just the beginning phase of it. And at the same time, it's natural. You just need to have a teacher that then, you know, breaks you out of it eventually, and and uh, um, you know, and you start to move to the other parts. Okay, so you stop idealizing spirituality or spiritualism, or whatever is it, uh, all these things that, uh, that we do when we are at the beginning of our journey, okay? Mm-hmm. So, listening to you, I basically uh, heard that you pretty much said it is not journey into the perfection, right? So, when people go into the spiritual journey, it's what you were saying that just one more practice, another teacher, another retreat, right? A little bit more realized. So it's certain, there's certain progression in this. Mm-hmm. And this fixation on being perfect, which then leads to narcissism and all other things that you described. So if it is not journey of perfection in this sense, then, uh, then what it is? Like, what are we aspiring to then? Well, again, you know, the, 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 that, that sense of that illusion of progression is one of the greatest threat. One more retreat, one more practice, one more amazing experience. Uh, oh, I am so conscious. I have one more ayahuasca trip uh, or, or one more incredible experience in meditation or one more. That illusion that you are progressing because you are having one experience or another experience or another experience, right? And then when you don't have that experience, you are craving or you are chasing after the next big experience in your practice, okay? 
and and that that is part of the fantasy of power that is part of that sort of uh, uh, neurotic narcissism okay um and uh, you know you can spend years uh, lost in it you know i've seen people that you know spend a life in it even greatly achieved uh, shamans or, or yogis or taoist masters or whatever is the qigong master doesn't really matter what right um <clears throat> But then they're still very um, unfulfilled or, or unintegrated uh, individuals in, in relation to all the rest. Um, so, um, yes, definitely the, the journey of the fantasy of power, it's, uh, again, it's, it's part of the development because uh, it's part of the teenage when you become powerful, potent. As a man, you start to have erections. As a woman, you became able, you become able to have children, your body, your forms develop. So you become potent, you become powerful. Okay. So when that is translated on the psychological level, that that's where this phase of the development is, is the fantasy of power, which is fine. It is a fundamental part of gaining sense of your power that you can, that you experience, you know, this thing is great. So again, there is nothing wrong in it. Um, it, it is just uh, uh, you say an incomplete picture, an incomplete vision of the picture. Thinking that 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 in itself, if you keep pushing it more, 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 higher, more perfect, more this, more this, that that illusion that is going is moving somewhere. Okay, and that by following that, you will actually become finally conscious or, or spiritual or whole or happy that is that is where the the sort of the mistaken perception is um the limited let's say limited vision of it rather than mistaken limited vision of it. um and so if you ask what is instead well i mentioned in the beginning it's a journey of individuation it's mm -hmm. a journey of, of uh, completion of integration okay um because if if you look at it you know, from 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 the perspective of uh, if you already are, okay. So I'm gonna play with you a little bit now, uh, philosophy, okay. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> All right. Um, there is a fundamental difference between uh, um, in ontology, which is sort of the side, the branch of philosophy that studies the nature, the definition of being. Okay, we make some fundamental distinctions now. If something is, by its very definition, it cannot be increased or it cannot be decreased. Okay. All right. So the sense what you are, okay, that sense of being, okay, it is not something that you can, you cannot be more. Okay. It just makes no logical, no philosophical, no ontological sense. You cannot be more. And you can never be less. You are. Because if you are more, that means that you were not. And if you can be less, it means that you are not. So either you are or you are not. So if you are, you cannot be more. You cannot be more conscious. Okay. You cannot be more spiritual. You cannot be higher, more connected. You are. Okay. So that's the sense of, of that being. And what we very often equate, it's being, so the verb to be is, okay, with the verb to have. Now, to be and to have exist on two completely different ontological planes. You cannot be more, but you can have more and have less. So in a state of confusion, you equate being with having, and you exchange the two, all right? And you start to relate to yourself and to reality at the level of having, okay? And therefore, you fall into the trap of having more or having less, and you equate that with being more and being less, but that is, uh, um, again, is, is, uh, is an ontological mistake, okay? It's a logical mistake, it's a philosophical mistake, okay? And even at the level of sort of neurology, 
it is uh, um, sort of a, a superposition and that doesn't really exist. Okay. Um, so why I'm saying this is because uh, in a journey of, of, of self-development, you see also this word is actually mistaken. The idea that the self, that you can develop the self, uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, and so let's go in the spiritual journey. The idea that you should or can be more. Okay. It's, it's really a sense that you can have more. I can have more experiences, more bliss, or I don't know, whatever is it, more, 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 but I can have more. Okay. And that's when the journey of spirituality becomes a journey of having. All right. That then become a journey of losing. Because only when you posit something to have, uh, you, you, the dualism of having something to lose then appear, right? And instead, if we, if we redirect uh, our perspectives uh, to understanding that what we do is an ontological journey of being, okay? And what you are is, it cannot be increased nor decreased. The only thing is that you need to, let's say, integrate it, make it all, because there are different parts of your being that have been, to a certain extent, uh, um, psychologically, um, and they're, they're not recognized. They are not integrated into the whole. They are always there. So it's not that, that you make more of you, okay? They are always there, okay? But you, you just need to remove uh, all the, 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 the partitioning eh, and, and the elements that these different parts of your being have separated themselves, compartmentalized themselves to. So a spiritual journey, in that sense, is a journey of individuation, that is, of understanding that you are, okay, of your being, eh, okay, of being rather than having and losing eh, or gaining something. People ask me, what do I gain? What, gonna, what I have when I do this practice? Will I be more conscious? Like if consciousness is something to have, I'm going to have more consciousness, okay? Which, again, it makes no sense because consciousness exists at the level of being and having exists at the level of having, not of being. <laughs> anyway, so this whole thing is very confusing. Um, um, so a spiritual practice and a spiritual journey is a journey of individuation and of integration of becoming whole not of becoming more conscious okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. if not if not in the, if not in the perspective of more sort of conscious of who you really are okay um yeah anyway mm -hmm. yeah to develop our, we could go very far. Yes, yeah, i know that you can go very deep and very far and we're just trying i guess to cover as much as we can, speaking about having more, right, during the time that we have uh, here today. Mm -hmm. So I would like to go further with our conversation and ask you mm -hmm. about Tantra, David, because I know that's mm -hmm. also a big part of your life and you have been really kind of studying and into yeah, this yeah. for a long time. One second. Sorry, well, about Tantra, your question was about Tantra. Yes, your, your understanding of it and also, I guess, mm -hmm. the, the ways that they're a bit more practical everyday implementation, if you could say so, when it comes mm -hmm. to everyday life, to the lifestyle, <clears throat> to modern people, right? Like, how do we bring this into the modern reality and our modern everyday life? And your experience of it also, your own experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because uh, the, the, the word Tantra uh, perfectly fits into the definition that I, that I, that I just gave because uh, the, the Sanskrit root of the, of the word literally means to weave together, okay, to interweave. Um, call it uh, the Buddhist uh, view of dependent origination, therefore that everything is connected and dependently um, originated and, and therefore sustaining itself. In a modern sort of linguistic language, we, you know, nowadays we speak of entanglement. Everything is, again, connected. And so the word tantra literally is the sense of weaving into a whole. 
Okay, and so again, it perfectly matches uh, what we were describing until now. And uh, and uh, the weaving the wholeness uh, of of your being, of your conscious, you know, subconscious, unconscious, you know, that then makes the superconscious appear, and then the and the collective unconscious. So that is really what tantra is. Um, and uh, in this journey, which you need to know. Um, you need to know how to take this journey, you know, what are the steps of it and where to go. Um, then you use different techniques uh, to facilitate this process of integration, of interweaving, okay, of your being, okay. And uh, um, therefore, Tantra, it's really a loose collection of uh, what in Sanskrit are called upadeshas, that is, of skillful means. Uh, to bring about this weaving, this 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 connecting of your being together, and uh, therefore there are many of these skillful means of these practices that that have as a whole tantra that is that that interconnected wholeness of your being. Okay, and uh, these techniques uh, range from. Uh, psychological intervention to different forms of meditation to you know of course sex because you know that's i would say that probably the tantra in 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 everyone's mind is associated most strongly with the idea of sexuality right and uh, it is true it is definitely mm, a very big part of tantra but it has to be understood that uh, um it <laughs> sex it's associated with tantra simply because it's the allegorical is the is the language that tantra used to describe okay the processes of of integration so again if we take non non tantric buddhism they would use a very different language okay that it's non sexual to describe certain processes which is fundamentally understanding the nature of the mind and how everything is connected and, and therefore dependent originated, right? Um, we move to Tantra and to describe the very same things, they use sexual imageries. So it's very important to understand that the chief connection that sex has with Tantra, it's just a language, is the, is the chosen allegorical language to describe uh, a process. Okay, so that's very important to understand. So they speak of this union, right? With that everything is connected and that you should become whole and connected with yourself. And so to speak of this, they use sexual images. So there is the deity, you create or you evocate the different deities. And then through this whole complex courtship to the deity with the mantras and the murtis and the yantras, you know, you gradually come to a state of union with the deity. But the deity then is realized, you know, symbolically in the process of the tantra, it is visualized outside and then eventually is brought in until it's realized that it's one and the same with you. So you become united with yourself through this ritualized sexual action, right? That this is like courtship. So the sexual action is really the, the finale of it, right? And then there is that, that bliss that arises from the union and the liberation of what is called that amrita, that, that, uh, um, mm, that immortal or un, undead awareness, undying awareness of, of, of the totality, the continuity of your being, right? So that is very important to understand that the, the, the sexual imagery of Tantra it's, uh, it's, has to do more to the chosen uh, linguistic allegories uh, to describe a process that has been described and it is described with different languages and different allegories uh, by different tradition. So that's very, very important to understand. Um, and then, of course, because they chose this specific uh, um, imagery, so sexual imagery, they also realize something very simple. They say, well, you know, if it is really about the idea of, of interweaving, realizing that everything is interwoven, everything is dependent, everything is therefore united and connected and not separated, so it's non-dual, okay? Everything, it's, it is really whole and one. Um, then what better example of it uh, and what better practice of it that actually 
sex, because that's really what we do in sex, you know, sex and everything that precedes sex. The courtship, you see someone and you like them, you feel this connection, this attraction, and, you know, and you work toward it and, you know, la, 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 first date, second date, and, you know, eventually kissing and the passion developing and you feel, uh, and then that great moment where you finally, you know, fulfill that desire and you experience in, in the moment of orgasm, the state of, you know, non-dualism, right, on, on, on that however brief moment, but there is a brief moment that during that, that, that ex- orgasmic explosion, you are into that state sort of in between, you really are weaving or woven and connected. So um, they therefore have developed uh, um, a lot of uh, um, liturgies and, and ritualistics and practices around uh, this sort of uh, um, mm, sexuality as a mean to experience this state of, of, of connectedness, of interwovenness. Um, <clears throat> there are, of course, uh, very gross misunderstandings about it because when in the 60s and 70s, actually, um, you know, for example, uh, Osho arrived in the, U- in, 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 in the West, okay, in the US, and he started to bring about this, you know, idea of tantric uh, um, sexuality, which matched with the sex or revolution of the West of, you know, free sex, free love, you know, and everything, people that were rejecting the models of the 50 of this very rigid post-Victorian uh, and, and sort of Christian-based uh, shame and guilt-based sexuality and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is a complex social analysis. And, and, and when Osho brought this idea of, of this tantric sexuality, it got enmeshed with uh, the development of also of Western psychology at the time and sexology. And, and so people now have an idea of what tantra is or, or sex in tantra is that is very far from, from what it actually meant and what, how it actually was done and practiced uh, um, in these tantric circles, okay? And nowadays, when I listen about tantra or, or tantric sex, uh, it's mostly um, sexual psychotherapy. Oh, we're going to touch each other and uh, release the shame or the hurt and now connecting each other's feelings and you embrace in connecting our energy, which is all very sweet, but it has really nothing to do um, um, with uh, um, the sexual approach or the sexual nature of these tantric practices the way that they are and were practices before. Okay. Um, and I always, I don't know, I need to break that, that, that sweet delusion that uh, actually tantric practices are extremely um, different okay now the root of the tantras uh, and the very early tantras both in the hindu and the buddhist tradition um, the core root of the tantras in relation to sexuality is uh, bhairav okay bhairav mm, or bhairava which is sort of the male and the, the female aspect of it and uh, bhairav it's the literal sanskrit uh, translation of the world orgasm. Now, the world orgasm, which everybody uses, again, when I really ask people, what does it mean? Do you know it? Everybody, oh, is this amazing, you know, la, 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 The word orgasm is come from ancient Greek, where it was developed in the tantric cults of Greeks, of Greece, okay, which were the famous Eolesis mysteries, the Dionysus practices. And the word orgasm, orge, in Greek, means rage. Okay. Now, bairav, the sexual part of the tantra, okay, in Sanskrit, means rage, wrath. Okay. Now, for all the people that are approaching tantric sex as a form of psycho, sexual psychotherapy to heal their uh, whatever is it, sexual traumas or whatever is it. Um, this is all very good, okay? And sexual psychotherapy can be very effective, but it has nothing to do with Tantra in that sense. Tantric sex is for very whole people that 
they have a very healthy sexuality, they are not broken or traumatized because tantric sex involves and is based on very, very raging sex. Okay. The power of Bayraf, the power of orgasm, is the transformation, and you have seen, I'm sure everyone probably has seen, representation of the tantric deities in their wrathful aspects. The eyes bulging out, you know, the fangs, uh, the, the symbol of the blood, you know, in the, in the tantric Hinduism, it's, uh, you know, Kali, the, Chinamasta, Chinam, they're all the different sort of uh, Mahadevis, eh, the form, form of the goddesses. And uh, it's uh, by Rav Shiva rather than, you know, Rudra, blah, 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 blah. So tantric sex, it's the riding and, and you consciously, okay, increase this wrath, this rage. Sex is an act of violence, okay? The nature of this of sexual desire is as this animal, consuming force. So it's called the consuming nature. That's why the tantric deities are called the blood drinking. Heruka, huh? that means drinking blood. It's sexual desire as this animal nature that you want to eat. You want to consume your partner. Okay, you want to, you know, literally, to a certain, to a certain sense, because you want to dream them, you want to consume them, you want to kill them, you want to destroy them. Okay, so it is a very, it is a very, very profound topic. I don't like to talk about this lightly because it is very often misunderstood and people are like, oh my God, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, so I keep this one for seminars and, and, and when people are ready to really get into these thematics. But long story short, and this is not book knowledge, this is because I actually lived with these people. Tantric rituals and tantric sex it is very far from sexual psychotherapy of stroking each other's, okay, and making you feel better. It is a very, very intense form of sex, okay, from which, in which you very often then it goes together with the consumption of some kind of psychedelics or intoxicants, not always, but often, in which you completely enter into this different state of mind, which is very wrathful, oh, very powerful. Okay, and you ride this way, both you and your partner. It takes two to tango. It cannot be done only once. So if your partner cannot enter into that state, there is no tantra. Okay, and when both partners, so Bhairav and Bhairavi, enter into the state, so you become the famous Shiva and Kali, um, then there is something unique that happens. Okay, and there is the awakening of what they call the Kundalini. So, okay, this, this dormant latent energy start to wake up. And you start to move uh, through different levels of uh, um, altered state of consciousness, let's say like this. Okay, they become also very visionary. So the vision that you have of the different gods and goddesses, and it starts to happen at this stage. And you need to be able to sustain this for a fairly long amount of time. Okay. And then what happened, just like it happened in, in the Greek cult of the uh, Dionysus mysteries and the Eleusis mysteries, uh, from this great rage, from this great transformation, okay, then arrive a moment where you go beyond it. Okay. In Sanskrit, it's called mano amani. You go beyond that mind. Okay, and Bhairav become Chinamusta. So the, the, there is a reversal. And so from this extremely wrathful, then you enter into this extremely peaceful and blissful state. Okay. And at that point, generally, the, the actual sexual act, it's, it's stopped. Okay. And you remain into this blissful state and the nectars uh, start to then uh, flow. And the nectars is both a very specific mental state uh, and also something quite physical that takes place. Um, so this again, I'm sorry if I break some um, visions or perspe perception that people have about Tantra, but uh, if we have to be historically accurate and correct, uh, that's really what Tantra is and what Tantra practice in relation to sex are. Okay. Uh, and again, they are not for everyone. Definitely, they are not for everyone. And uh, um, 
and, and, and not everyone should attend them, and not everyone need this, okay, path, need this specific approach. Okay, very important to understand. Um, and then people ask me, oh, what about with this orgasm, right? And, and the actual sort of the physical reflection of orgasm that is like when, when, when you come, both as a man and as a woman, and people say, oh, you know, you should, you know, uh, the, don't release this orgasm. So there is all mythology connected to ejaculation, and you should, and you should, you know, la, 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 la. And this one is a whole big, uh, very, very misunderstood uh, element of, of uh, tantric sexuality, um, where then sort of men or women castrate themselves, uh, trying not to come because they think that, that that's practice in Tantra, okay? And then, you know, all this energy, now I can do this, I can do that, you know, blah, 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 blah. Again, it has nothing to do with it. We will now not go into it because it's too long. Uh, we might have a separate conversation about this, but... Um, um, when you have sex, enjoy, come regularly, don't worry, you are not losing any energy, all is good, okay? <laughs> On this wonderful note, David, after you completely aroused, I'm sure everyone's <laughs> desire, as they were listening to you talking about it in such uh, vivid details, <laughs> then we can just tell people that they're probably going to be part two to this conversation as we are coming to the time of our time together. <laughs> And <laughs> so if we want to go deeper in the subject of Tantra, which probably we will, then we're just going to come again and dive in right away. And I just thought... I, 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 like, I, I like how you phrased it. We should come again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Freud, and I guess, right? <laughs> you see, after absolutely, listening absolutely. to you and the dose. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so mental orgasm is equally important as all other orgasms that we can absolutely. possibly have. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much for Very coming well. coming here today, and thank <laughs> you for <laughs> enlightening. Good choice of word. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, thanks for tuning in. So we will ask David to come back again. So now that you have your arousal state, uh, we will also include some information how you can connect with David if you wish to explore it further, and to be continued. See everyone. Much See love. Thank you guys. Bye. Yes. Bye. <laughs>what a conversation deep informative spicy i feel there will be a part two coming very soon did you enjoy the interview feel free to share this episode with friends subscribe to the podcast and consider to support us on patreon stay wild and be humble the stretcher